Although Mahler's second symphony was the first of his works to find widespread success, the process that generated it was the longest and most difficult he would experience as a composer. And this symphony may not have reached its final fruition or even come into being at all if not for Mahler's relationship with a legendary conductor who despised his music. In late March of 1891, the 30-year-old Mahler arrived in Hamburg to assume the post of principal conductor of the Hamburg State Opera. In addition to being Germany's second largest city and the birthplace of Brahms, Hamburg was the home of Europe's most renowned conductor, Hans von Bülow. Although Mahler's previous attempts to gain Bülow's attention had been summarily rebuffed, the elder musician soon had the opportunity to develop a close acquaintance with Mahler's conducting, and his unequivocal endorsements of the young conductor's work became so frequent and public that within a few months Mahler was known internationally as a rising star. Moreover, the personal relationship between the two musicians flourished to such an extent that Mahler soon developed the courage to ask Bülow if he would be willing to hear one of his works. But this was a hazardous request. Although the famously irascible Bülow had once been a strongly progressive musician, his cuckolding by Wagner, who sired three children with Bülow's wife Cosima, while the conductor dutifully prepared and led the premieres of Tristan und Isolde and Die Meistersinger, all but destroyed him psychologically and physically. This very public humiliation led Bülow to remake his professional life, and before long he was embracing the conservative, classically oriented circle of Brahms in the so-called War of the Romantics. Further, Mahler's career as a composer was in limbo. The death of his parents and a sister in 1889, as well as the demands of his expanding career as a conductor, had stalled his progress. He'd written the first movement of his second symphony, a massive funeral march, back in 1888, during the rush of creative energy that had brought forth the completion of his first symphony. But this was a period during which Mahler conceived his symphonies in narrative terms, and his difficulty imagining what would follow this darkly ferocious opening so paralyzed him that he considered making this first movement a standalone work, a tone poem with the title Totenfeier, or Funeral Rites. And this was the piece Mahler chose to play for Bülow, whose reaction the composer later described to a friend. I went to the piano and began playing. After a few minutes, I looked up and saw Bülow standing near the window, holding his hands over his ears. I stopped, but Bülow asked me to continue. A few moments later, I looked up and saw that Bülow still had his hands over his ears. I played to the end of the piece, finishing in deathly silence. Finally, Bülow exclaimed, If what I have just heard is music, then I no longer understand anything about music. Mahler was crushed, and it took him almost two years to regain the confidence he needed to confront the challenges of large-scale symphonic composition. Yet he would be bolstered by the financial security his position in Hamburg provided, the prospect that his growing prestige would result in more frequent performances of his music, and above all, his inherent sense of mission. Vowing to devote his summers to creative work, he settled in the summer of 1893 in the spectacular lakeside village of Steinbach in Upper Austria. Renewing his work on the Second Symphony, Mahler took two melodies he'd sketched at the time he'd written the Totenfeier and developed them into a second movement, a charming Austrian Lindler that contains the symphony's lightest, most diversionary music. During the period when Mahler was struggling to move forward with the Second Symphony, he nurtured his creative impulses by writing songs based on texts from the folk anthology Des Knaben Wunderhorn, or The Youth's Magic Horn. One of its tales, St. Anthony of Padua's Sermon to the Fish, depicts the great preacher going down to the sea and delivering the good word to an assembly of different fish that poke their glassy-eyed heads above the surface to listen and then, after the sermon is done, dive back underwater to resume their life of ignorance and sin. Mahler found this poem to be an apt depiction of human folly and hypocrisy, and it served as the inspiration for both a song setting and the third movement of his symphony, a sardonic scherzo of the sort that would become an iconic feature of Mahler's style. For the fourth movement, Mahler took one of his previous Wunderhorn songs called Urlicht, or Primal Light, and orchestrated the original piano accompaniment. The text's expression of compassion for humanity's existential plight, as well as the deep spirituality that pervades Mahler's setting, stand in marked contrast to the scherzo's light cynicism, thus providing an essential shift in tone and mood. 
By summer's end, Mahler could point with pride to the strides he'd made with the Second Symphony, yet the challenge of completing the work remained, and the idea for a finale that would tie the symphony's narrative together and bring it to the sort of conclusion he envisioned still eluded him. The breakthrough would come the following year, catalyzed by the death of Hans von Bülow on February 12, 1894. Sitting among the mourners at Bülow's funeral, Mahler heard the choir sing a chorale setting of the poem The Resurrection by the 18th century German poet Friedrich Klopstock. As Mahler would later recall, it was as if I had been struck by lightning. Everything suddenly rose before me clearly. Such is the flash for which the Creator awaits. After that, I had to create in sound what I had just experienced. Soon Mahler was back in his apartment, madly scribbling out a plan for the Second Symphony's finale. The nihilistic proposition of the first movement would be answered in the finale by the concept of death as a portal to eternal life, as articulated in Klopstock's Ode Resurrection with supplementary text by Mahler. Thus, in a truly Oedipal twist, the death of Bülow, the musician whose rejection of Mahler's music had plunged the young composer into a crisis of confidence now became the stimulus for the Second Symphony's completion. Returning to Steinbach in early June, Mahler immediately set to work developing the sketches for the finale, weaving in material from the first, third, and fourth movements to create architectural unity. This integration and synthesis of materials written years apart demonstrates an essential feature of Mahler's art. The stuff of Mahler's symphonies is the stuff of his life, at once subjective and universal, which he takes and transforms into profound psychological, spiritual journeys. In this regard, the Second Symphony is a particularly compelling illustration, and Mahler's reaction upon hearing the work for the first time has been confirmed by musicians and music lovers for generations. The whole thing sounds as though it has come to us from some other world, and I think there is no one who can resist it. <laughs> 